Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I'm Ramon Pia, here bringing you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course, not there any views. Uh, this week on the show, it's episode number 130 of the podcast, so there it is. I have seven new Lit RPG titles for you folks at home, uh, including Ambrosia Quest, a Lit RPG novel, uh, then also... Loot Lord, a gamelet fantasy novel, Dungeon Land book number one. Uh, after that, it'll be Erd Online, Inside, a little bitty gamelet novel. Uh, and after that, it'll be The Lost City, The Realms book two. Uh, then it'll be Guardians of the Round Table, uh, book number two, Goblin Boots. Uh, then after that, it'll be Un- Anomaly, Somnia Online, book number two. And last but not least, it'll be Underworld, Through the Belly of the Beast, Underworld, book number two, the sequel to uh, Love, Love, or Die. So there we go. Before we get into the reviews, though, we're going to move into a lit RPG news. And in lit RPG news, we're going to begin with uh, Apollo Thorn. He's actually the author of one of the other uh, lit RPG novels reviewing this week on the show. But to help promote the second book in the series and that release, he's actually going to be putting book one in that series on sale for, until Tuesday. August the 28th, it'll be on sale for $1.99, so it's a good book, um, go check it out, definitely got a good review score from us, um, but entertaining, and then after that, go read book number two, equally as good. Okay, uh, also in Little Bitchy News, we have author C.E. Keen, uh, she's an author of the upcoming novel Hunter's Bond, which you have in the Little Bitchy, um upcoming list uh, on the show, uh, it'll be out on the 28th, I believe, of August as well. Um, however, she is actually doing a very interesting novel release. I actually like, liked a lot, so I'm including the show notes here. Um, the novel is in part based on her love for Monster Hunter franchise, and she's hosting an online launch party from August 28th to September the 1st, uh, the same period that Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate comes out for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, the author will also be hosting games for that, as well as the PS4 version of Monster Hunter World. Um, the Monster Hunter games are very much about co-op, and I think this is a, we're getting a really kind of neat way to promote your book that's coming out, especially if it's incorporating um, some of the concepts and some of the themes from that particular uh, game franchise. So good for, for them. I'll put a link in the show notes for the Facebook um, event uh, for that author's launch party and also the, the game stuff is there as well. Okay, uh, here is a schedule for the author signings at the Literary Debut booth at Dragon Con. Well, um, we'll have a link to the show notes for the podcast, of course. We can see these actual pictures in these Excel spreadsheets. Uh, this was very nicely done by Shadow Alley Press. Uh, so they'll, they'll be there as well. Uh, but for the, remember, the Little RPG booth table at DragonCon will be at uh, America's Mart Building Number 2, West Wing, second floor, booth numbers 2820 and 2822. So apparently we're getting two booth spaces, which is awesome. Um, and again, you'll note that Dakota Crouch, James Hunter, Jeffrey Vaughn and Logue, and Aloran Kong are all scheduled here for um, like book signing specifically with time slots. And that's mostly just to avoid uh overcrowding of the booth space i think last year a lot of the authors just kind of showed up and were there all day every day uh and for a small booth space having five people there <laughs> was a little crowded um especially you know adding me in there for like number six um i won't be doing signing just because i don't have any books to sell there i'm not bringing books for people to purchase i'll be there though with for the podcast um i'll be happy to sign anything to be once when i'm happy to be there um i just found an official like schedule post a lot of the other authors actually have also um panels that they're going to be on this year. Um, so that's good. I think uh, literary authors being on some of these uh, convention panels. Uh, I know James A. Hunter, um, Alaron Kong and Michael Chatfall are on panels. Uh, Michael Chatfall will also be stopping by the booth as I'm sure like a number of other like literary authors will as well. Um, so uh, hopefully if you're a fan, you want to come by, you can catch everybody, but definitely these are the times when these particular authors are going to be there. And they're usually like these, you know, Block after block after block. So, like between the hour, for example, on Friday, uh, Dakota Kraut will start off the signing section on Friday um, uh, for uh, Friday of Dragon Con, I should say. Um, and he'll start there at 1 p.m. He'll be there for an hour. After that, James Hunter will show up and that 3 p.m. Jeff Fuckle and Logue at 4 p.m. on Friday. It'll be Alaron Kong. And they kind of go all, all that through, throughout the entire Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So go check the schedule out in the show notes um, if you want to get a specific time period. So, there you go. Um, I'll also have um, in the show notes. 
um, schedules for the panels that these authors are going to be on. Uh, Al Ron Kong has a whole list of panels. He's going to be on the entire convention, um, including like what is diversity, social media is effective tool, uh, cyberpunk and technology and a bunch of other things. So uh, check the notes for the actual specific time slots. I uh, also have a list for suffer James A. Hunter from Shadow Alley Press as well. He'll be has a number of panels at Dragon Con as well. And Michael Chatfield as well. Michael Chatfield actually only has two panels he's being on he's on, uh, including social media as an effective tool for authors. And what's the other one? Oh, Cyberpunk and Technology in Y. So check your schedules. Um Michael Chatfield's listing in the show notes actually has the the location of those of those particular um panels as well so there you go so lots of good information again it's it's hard to convey uh for just the audio version of the podcast exactly what the schedule are. they're very complicated and they're for multiple people so i do encourage you to check out the show notes uh, if you're not watching the visual version of the podcast on youtube or on our website okay uh last bit of news is for alaron kong author of the chaos seed series um a little bit of a thing uh he, he's a finalist on the dragon awards for best fantasy series um at dragon con and he's modified the his month-long celebration giveaway a little bit uh just at the request of some of the dragon con officials uh the original rules for the contest which are shown in like a screenshot in the show notes um kind of encourage people to to vote in the dragon con uh, awards for the dragon awards uh and that was the intent of it but some folks took the wording of that particular post and some other posts in the past um as alaron trying to buy votes um and reported it to dragon con officials i had about half a dozen people um individually tell me about this uh so that's why it's showing up in the notes because again it is blood rpg news um i asked alaron uh kong about this directly and he denies ever intending to buy votes or making a vote for him a requirement to enter the contest at all and i personally i didn't think he meant to either when i first saw the contest i talked about it a couple weeks ago on the show um it never really seemed to me that that was the intent but at the same time i'm um, looking at the the posting wording i can kind of see where people kind of got that impression and again um i think everybody agrees oh buying votes is not okay uh and so it, with that intent um Alloran said he talked to the dragon con officials and they agreed that he didn't do anything wrong um but that they did ask that he kind of modify the terms of his contest just to remove any even hint of impropriety with the contest at all and also to you know sh- tell people like oh, okay this is just a thing that's not really a thing um but there you go and that that's kind of it uh, Aloran did ask me directly uh to note that because the awards are fan driven the rules do encourage authors to get their fans to vote um which then there's nothing wrong with that i think for some people who had an issue with this there was the just the impression that oh entering the contest part of that was oh you have to vote for Aloran, and that was never really the case um as far as even I could see, but I do, again, I do understand because of the specific wording of the contest that was earlier there. Some people may have had that oppression, uh, but there you go. Uh, he also asked that I drop a link to the rules in the show notes for the contest if anybody has any issues, uh, and I have done so. So there you go. Uh, and that's it for a little RPG news. Okay, uh, out now. These are some titles of novels I haven't had a chance to read, uh, but are out now, including Faithful Defender, a little bit of game led adventure no- novel. Uh, Alternia online book number two. This is actually a really interesting series. We like book one a lot. Um, the the c- novel covers never really do this novel justice, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just letting you know, just don't just by the cover because the novels are actually better than the cover. Uh, book bitter book number two is out by V. Moody. Um, these next three are actually novels that came out in July, but um, some fans let me know they exist. I'm like, oh, I don't remember you mentioning this. I'm like, I didn't either because Amazon didn't show me them, but they don't tell me about them. So I want to make sure you guys know about them as well. Uh, Gaia's Gambit Evolution Online book number one is out. Special thanks to Gene for, for letting me know about this directly. It was nice to me. She's like, hey, did you see this? I'm like, no, but thanks for letting me know. Uh, also out is World Keeper book number three. I had no idea this came out personally. I'm a fan of the series, fan of the author. Um, it's just like, sometimes Amazon just doesn't show me the things that I want to see. Uh, it's also huge. It's like 1,700, over 1,700 pages long. Um, also from Justin Miller, Keeper's World Hell's Game is out as well. Again, all those last three just came out in July. Um, so you might have missed them, as as did I. Just in my Amazon searches, they did not come up. Okay, um, some new lit RPG audiobooks that came out this week. Um, Warden, novel uh, Nova Online, book number one, is out as an audiobook now. We gave the uh, ebook version a 6 out of 10. Just had some issues. Uh, but overall, still very interesting story. Just, you know, game mechanic stuff, basically. Uh, and some wand wavy 
you know, fights. Uh, but still, uh, go check it out. Go listen to a sample before you judge it. Uh, out as an audiobook as well as Time of Change, Emerilia book number seven. We gave it a good review. That's a book number seven in the Emerilia series by Michael Chatfield. Uh, uh, so also out is Valley of Death, Apocalypse Capes, author cuts book number two. Um, we give it a 7.4 out of 10. Um, and out is New Eden Royale, an apocalypse lit RPG series by Nick Davis. Uh, as an audiobook, we give it a score of a 5 out of 10 as an ebook review. Again, sometimes narrators matter. Sometimes a good narrator can really elevate a story, um, even if you have issues with the ebook version. And sometimes a, a, a bad narrator can can take down a, a good story sometimes. So it does you know, matter. Uh, I always recommend that you listen to a sample of the story before you purchase it. Um, but, you know, our reviews help you to see at least what we thought of, in this case, me, what I thought of the uh, ebook version of these stories. Uh, let's see, also out as an audiobook is Accidental Duelist, Accidental Champion Trilogy, book number one, um, and The Legacy Builder, The Chronicles of Lincoln Hart. Uh, Bar- Barakador, book number one. We gave that one a score of seven out of ten as the ebook version. Some very interesting town building stuff in there as well. Lots of good um, crafting ish stuff as well. Uh, haven't listened to the audiobook, of course. That's now a different podcast. Okay, and that's it for the stuff that's uh, out now. Some upcoming stuff in our Little Bridge series is your upcoming list. This is where I read off the titles that I know that are coming out in the near future. Um, we do have some new additions to this particular list, um, but of course you can skip ahead if you want. Uh, Dan the Adventurer, a game lit Heron Fantasy Adventure, will be out on August the 26th. I Am Gamer by uh, Gabriel Rothwig, it'll be out on August the 26th as well. Only a few days away. Um, How to Train Your Kaiju will be out on August the 27th. On August the 28th, it'll be Hunter's Bond, Apex Chronicles book number one. This is the um, the Monster Hunter-ish inspired story <laughs> that, the, that the other game launch thing was talking about in the new, Illuminate News. So that, this is that book. Um, on August the 30th, it'll be The Second Realms, 10 Realms book number one by Michael Chatfield. So this is the second book in that series, new, new to the list. It'll be out on August the 30th at the beginning of Dragon Con, basically. Um, on September the 1st, Coast on Fire, The System Apocalypse book number one will be out. I'm sorry. Book number five will be out on September the 3rd. The Path of Just Cause Universe, book number 14. This is uh, essentially the only lit RPG title in this series. Um, I have a portion of it. It is lit RPG, and it has some very interesting themes. It'll be out on September the 3rd. On September the 4th, Limitless Project, uh, Project Chrysalis, book number two, will be out. September the 4th as well, it'll be Nightmare Keep, Euphoria Online, book number two, um, from Phil Tugger. A lot of people seem to enjoy this. Book number two is going to be out. Um, there you go. On September the 24th, the Game Changer, Rally Benders, book number three, will be out. Um, September 26th, Free Haven Online, Lady Thunder Lord, Into Hades, book number two. September 28th, Couch, Potato, Chaos, Game Bound. Apparently, I said it incorrectly a few times. Uh, so it'll be out on September the 28th. On September, on October the 8th, it'll be the second book in the NPC Path series, Kingdom of the Dead. On October the 25th, uh, A Clan's Honor, a Little Bit Adventure. On November 21st, Free Haven Online, Winter Dungeon Land, book number three. There we go, folks. Those are all the upcoming titles that I know about. On to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we're going to begin with Ambrosia Quest, uh, a little bit of novel Omniverse book number one written by Lawrence Ambrose. Um, it is 441 pages, $2.99 that are available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, instead of reading the author's description, I'm just going to get right to review. The author has a lot of uh, novels in a variety of genres. This one seems like an essentially attempt to either write to a market the author doesn't understand or possibly just innocently Miss Mark, the author, did contact me saying, here's a little bit of story. Can you review it? Are you interested? Um, so it kind of seems like he knows that he's trying to target a particular audience. Um, however, the while the novel might be considered VR suspense, it is not lit RPG. It is not, not even close. Um, there is a competitive VR combat game in the story. But I mean, it's not really game-like. It's, it's more realistic, simulated combat with rankings. Uh, there is also a VR contest in an alternate normal world, basically, where a small group of players have to travel around the U.S. to solve clues, puzzles, and find items. Uh, very scavenger, uh, scavenger hunting kind of thing. Um, however, no matter what the setting is in the story, there are no RPG mechanics or RPG progression. Um, there are a few mentions of, like, levels, but they're not really there as, as like, kind of a game mechanic. They're just, oh... Here's a, here's a thing. He's level three, and that doesn't mean anything kind of stuff. Um, 
There are also um, a few sex scenes in here. They're well, not particularly well described, but they do exist. And there are some real life elements um, with like suspense. Um, and so those things are actually decently written. They have a sense of suspense elements. Uh, the main character, Alex, is actually an interesting character. But again, the story just isn't a little RPG as it's being advertised in various groups um, and as it was being presented on Amazon. And so it's not little BG, um, gets a score of four out of 10. Um, there you go. So gets a negative view just because it's essentially false advertising, whether it's intentional or not. Um, so there you go. The Ambrosia Quest, a liberty novel, Omniverse, book one with a score of four out of 10. Okay, on to our next review. It is going to be uh, Loot Lord, a game lit fantasy novel, Dungeon Land, book number one, written by M.J. Kettlebrenner. Kettlebrenner? I'm going to go Brenner. Um, it is 177 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Edon and his friends are in the adventure shop business, and business is terrible. The dungeon boon of decades past is sorely dead. The economy is in the outhouse, and the guild has a stranglehold on any remaining riches to be gleaned from the tapped dungeons in the area. They'll be lucky to keep their heads above water for another week, and that's only if the guild doesn't break their legs to recover mounting debts. Things are looking pretty bleak. When Edon finds a rather peculiar sword doing a last-ditch effort to scrounge some valuable loot to sell. Armed with a secret that could solve all their problems, the three friends know they can't let anyone find out about the amazing new dungeon levels and the undiscovered loot therein. But where there is loot, there is always lurking death. Maybe the violent thugs for the guild will help will end up being their least of their problems. Found out if they can live long enough to become the loo- the lords of loot. So there you go. Um, essentially, this is a really simple review. It's a dungeon crawl. Um, it is a little RPG, although the little RPG leveling elements are, are pretty basic. Um, I think the main character only gains one or two particular powers, Eden, um, and his friends. Never, you actually never seen any of his friends' um, character sheets, and, and there's barely a character sheet for the main character as well. But there are uh, stats that progress, there are skills that increase, and there's loot diving and adventuring and XP and, and all that good stuff. So, but the, the, the RPG mechanics are fairly basic um so nothing really right about there but this is a slice of life dungeon dive the action is pretty decent it was from decent to relatively good and there's even an um kind of an interesting plot line that's supposed to tie up tie this book into the next book um and keep you reading uh this almost feels like a um a short story serial series except it's a little longer than short story obviously at 177 pages uh, but it kind of has that vibe like oh this is meant to be consumed in like these chunks uh, and for what it is which is essentially a slice of life dungeon dive um it's it's entertaining um it, it's again not super amazing anything um it gets a score of 7.1 out of 10 for me mostly because like oh it kind of rode that line between oh you what you're doing is really good it's entertaining it really is it, it's fine um but again it's what is there is basic it's you go into the dungeon, you fight some monsters, you hack it some loot. There's a little bit outside story, outside the dungeon story. And then you repeat and you cycle. And the 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 entertainment value of the story it's it's kind of it. It's just action, dungeon dive, you know, level up kind of stuff. And for what it is again, entertaining, just be aware of what you're getting into, obviously. Uh with any slice life story, you either kind of like the kind of story where you can just kind of pop in and out and it's just a stream of things happening. Or it's not like you ex- are expecting like this major plot, save the world kind of stuff, or like there's a bunch of character and rule development. Nope, not here. Uh, so but for what it is, I find it to be interesting enough. So for me, it gets score being a 7.1 out of 10 for Loot Lord, a game lit fantasy novel, Dungeon Land, book number one. Okay, uh, on to Erd Online, Inside, a little RPG game lit novel written by Chris Savage. It is 323 pages, $3.99, available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description. Enter to play, when to escape. It seemed like harmless fun at first when Justin entered the world of Erd Online. He quickly discovers that the real game is trying to save his own reality. Justin Schwartz is obsessed with Erd, one of the most popular franchises in the world. The most recent iteration of the game has been in development for a decade and is called Erd, inside a virtual world that lives and breathes independent of its creators. As part of a massive PR campaign, Omega Dega starts a contest for people to join the open beta of Erd inside. Obsessed with getting, Justin exploits the system to win a slot in the beta, but his actions don't go unnoticed. A hacker called Predictable <laughs> spotted Justin's exploit and blackmails the leadership of Omega Dega. Either they allow Justin in the game and trap him there until he finishes the son of Schwarzfield questline, or uh, Predictable 
destroys Erd uh, inside so thoroughly that they can't recover a decade of work. Let the game begin. Okay, so there you go. So that um, novel description is a little off. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's like I said, it's not inaccurate uh, for the most part, but it does describe things that never seem like harmless fun uh, in the storyline. Okay, um, technically this is a literary novel. It is set in a game world and there are um, some RPG progression elements, um, but they're relatively minor to the overall story. Um, you'll there are descriptions of people leveling the story. There are descriptions of people like powering up. Um, but you, you mostly see this in the form of like notifications of like, oh, this set of skills or this set of things that you that the main character or other characters done um, are increasing by this amount of points um, after they've done them. And that's kind of the extent of the RPG mechanics in the story. Um, though, like I said, they're relatively minor. So if you want a crunchy RPG action story, this is not going to be it. Like the, you're not going to enjoy the story for the RPG mechanics. You're not going to enjoy the story because of the action. Those are going to relatively minor portions of the story. They exist and they exist throughout the novel. Um, but what this novel does do that's very interesting is, is it has some very interesting characters. It does some very interesting pop cultural world building and it has a ton of dialogue. Um, and, and some of the dialogue is very good. Some of it is, is very funny and entertaining and humorous. Um, and some of it is very philosophical um, and debate oriented. And if you're into that kind of story, if you like that kind of stuff, you're really going to like the story. Um, I did. I was in the mood for this kind of thing, but I could very well see like a lot of people saying like, oh, this isn't what I was looking for. Uh, I wanted something actual oriented or crunchy or like super crunchy letter tea, and that just isn't it so depending on what kind of mood you're in this may or may not kind of be the thing for you like i said there is like a really big philosophical narrative in the story about the nature of reality what it means to be alive um and it's kind of comparison between like oh these game characters the main characters seeing who, who are supposed to be npcs are so real and realistic and so he has these more contraries about oh he's an assassin class and he has to decide oh how do i feel about murdering them like killing monsters or like how, how am I supposed to treat these people? And there's really a, like a legitimately a philosophical debate between himself and some other characters and within his eternal monologue uh, about, again, the nature of reality. And at one point, uh, a game world can be considered the same as a real world. And that's a theme throughout this entire story again and again and again. Um, and so that, that did say uh, that's, it's a very interesting way of doing something. Um, and again, it's going to appeal to some people and not to others. Um, let's see. And it's all kind of couched in this, like, again, outlandish premise of forcing the main character to play in this full immersion fantasy game um, and trapping him there unless he finishes this game sooner to become king. And again, there are some very interesting adventures and a lot of talking. Um, and again, I kind of emphasize how much talking there is because it kind of became a point for me. of Like, oh, this is might be a little too much. Um, but at the same time, like, oh, it's okay. It, it, it is what it is. But the adventures themselves where the main character goes on to fulfill that quest of, like, becoming king by um, doing certain tasks for these four sub-kingdoms, um, so they're all interesting and they're all very entertaining in their own right. Um, but again, it's not always necessarily like the RPG kind of way. The, the, the world very much is a game world and there are definitely game tropes in there, including RPG mechanics and tropes. But again, that's not the emphasis. Like it, a lot of the story revolves around, oh, do you get the author's sense of humor? Do you kind of get the uh, the digs he's making at pop culture or the pop culture references? And if you do, uh, great, you're going to enjoy this. And if you don't, you just you probably won't enjoy it as much and that's just one of the things like this is kind of a very um written uh, i think it will appeal to a very specific you know kind of audience um it's one of the things that's gonna either push readers away or it's gonna delight them immensely and it's just gonna have to get a sample to see if it's going to be that kind of thing for you um overall even though the, de the debating and there's little debating between characters for like pages and pages and pages sometimes especially towards the end and some like uh, rhetoric and things like that um kind of got a little repetitive to me in, in a few places but that's a minor thing um overall it's still a good read i appreciated the philosophical themes i appreciated the sense of humor personally and i like the pop culture references um but even for me sometimes it kind of rode the line between uh, is this still entertaining and am i getting uh is it getting a little tedious with the dialogue and for me by the end of the story i was like oh, okay i just kind of teetered over to the entertaining side so for me it could score 7.1 out of 10 uh that's earned online inside a liturgy gamelet novel with the score of 7.10 but again it very much is the kind of story war it's not going to appeal to everybody uh so just be aware of what is there there you go okay on to our next review which is going to be there you go. Uh, the Lost City, The Realms, Book 2, an epic lit RPG adventure written by C.M. Carney. 
Okay, it is 600, 16 pages, $5.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. The sequel to the best-selling lit RPG epic, Borrow King. I cannot believe that idiot, idiotic plan worked. The only thing Griff wanted when he entered the realms was to find his missing sister. Then he pissed off on power-hungry god, got stuck in the undead hell known as the Borrow, and nearly had his soul consumed. Then things trended upwards, and with the help of a ragtag group of companions, Griff escaped a, ver a, a verdant paradise of magic and wonder. Sorry, two, a verdant paradise of magic and wonder. But when his exposed secrets led to betrayal and murder, Griff is forced to accept an insane quest, or his new friends will face the headman's axe. Now, to stop a world-conquering zealot from capturing an ancient weapon of incredible power, Griff must become the one thing he never wanted to be, a leader. Standing in his way are a group of crazed cultists, an army of deadly magic machines, and friends who no longer trust him. And he is still no closer to saving his sister. The Lost City. Oh, sorry. That's where So there you go. Uh, uh, and just to be FYI, that whole saving the sister thing and being trapped in this kind of game world completely disappears from the story. So I don't think there's, that there's actually going to be any progression there on that respect. Um, this is, again, 616 pages, 5 dollars 99 available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, this is the second book for the main character in the series, but it's technically the third book in the series. There was a, a book in the middle about a, a side character, Lex, who was separated from the main character in book one. He got his own book, which is very entertaining in its own right, uh, but we're returning to the, to the main arc of the story in this book. So there you go. Okay, um, the game mechanics and story are exactly the same as they were in book one, so there's nothing really new to talk about there. Um, there are some larger periods in the story, though, however, that feel more fantasy than lit RPG. Um, and it's mostly outside combat. In combat, you get to see the, the, the powers being used, the spells, etc. Um, and there is a description of, like, you know, RPG stuff, like levels and etc. Uh, but outside of combat, there, there are generally some stretches of the story where it's like, oh, this, this is absolutely feeling fantasy. And... and that's neither good nor bad necessarily. It kind of depends on kind of read you are. If you just want RPG goodness and, and game stuff, the entire bit of the story, that's those sections might feel annoying to you. But if you are okay with that, if you're okay with kind of a, a semi fantasy setting occasionally, especially with anything including like the elves in the story, um, this might be generally fine or it might really be really good uh, for you in particular. Um, but again, it is it is something that I noted. In, in, in my reading of the story. Um, again, it kind of shifts from the story in the series from trapped in a game to, oh, transferred to a fantasy world with RPG rules in some respect. Um, and book three of the three that I've read in the series is definitely the least, has the least game vibe. Um, again, with most of the RPG stuff, seen during combat with quest notifications and, and, and lulls um, where like the main character is leveling up or someone else is leveling up and choosing powers and stuff. Now, the fights in the story are probably the best part of this. Um, they are wonderfully described, and they get pretty epic at, at some points in the story. But much like they were in book one, they honestly get a little bit wand wave. And this kind of, again, leans towards like, oh, this is, in some instances, it feels more fantasy-esque. And that in a little bitty story that's like full-on game mechanics, your game mechanics kind of decide whether your main character is going to win or lose sometimes. Um, and they're definitely like, hard rules about, oh, if your main character runs out of mana, and it runs out of mana, and he can't do spells anymore. If he runs out of stamina, he passes out, or something like that. And, and there are, like, some very hard hard um, boundaries. Um, yet, in the story, in book one in particular, um, with the main character, a lot of times, the story is just felt one waving that they were, oh, the main character is ignoring his limitations of stamina, mana, or even health. Like, in this story, they're several times where the main character just should have died. Um, and that's just, again, something I'm not judging the author for. It's just, oh, it's not really following the game mechanics that are established. And that's kind of just world rule following. And that, again, it doesn't, it only takes a, a, a minor bit away from the story because, the, again, the rest of the combat scenes are very well written. But for some people, it's, it's going to be annoying. And for me, it was a little bit, but not so much that it really stopped the overall story from being enjoyable. Um... There you go. Let's see. Story-wise, um, again, none of the chapter in the game or the Save the Sister storyline really kind of exists. I think they're acknowledged a few times as like minor points of like, oh yeah, that's right. I should be. I wanted to save my sister, but I'm in this other situation. Um, the instead the Noe storyline actually gets really pretty epic pretty quickly, um, and again, it is kind of a pivot 
in the storyline a little bit because book one in the series very much felt like, oh, the main character is trapped in a game. He's set in this dungeon crawl situation and he goes through it and he exits the story. And now in book number three, which is the continuation after where the, where the storyline picks up at, um, it kind of, again, takes this epic fantasy storyline turn a little bit. And that does lend the story like a big sense of epicness and like uh, to me the storyline in the uh, in the novel kind of meshes fellowship of the rings with hellboy 2 the guard golden army and some cthulhu lore um and all those are very epic fantasy kind of stories so if that works for you great uh, uh the the those kind of themes really do a lot uh, lend like some very good world building opportunities which the author does take advantage of like you feel like there's a rich cultural history for all these all the all these situations in the novel so good for the author um and they're genuinely epic feeling to some of the fights and consequences in in the novel um but again at, at the consequence of that is that the rpg aspects where there are some again some finite boundaries to those rpg mechanics aren't always followed and sometimes those elements feel to be less important and again, it, again for me it didn't take away from things too much for the story it's just that had that those elements also just been developed as well as the epic fantasy stuff um it would have been like almost a great novel but because they weren't you know so it doesn't make it uh not good it's just oh, okay it could have been could have been super awesome and in this case it, it's just like oh really good which is not again that any way shape or form i had a good time with the story despite like the few issues i had nothing there really ruined the story from any way shape or form again it's just things that like oh this stopped it from being like really really great you know what i mean um and in this case it's like oh it becomes a, it's a really good story uh so uh, and i think again this particular arc in the story does again bring like a nice epic scale to it uh for me it gets over 7.6 out of 10 um, for The Lost City, The Realms, book number two, an epic little bit adventure with a score of 7.6 out of 10. So there we go. Okay, on to our next review. It'd be Guardians of the Round Table, book number two, Goblin Boots by Avril Sabine, um, Storm Peterson, and Rise Peterson. So it's a author combo. Um, it is 244 pages, $2.99. It is by One Candle Limited. Here's the author's description. When all actions have repercussions, it isn't really a game. Returning to Inadon, Mallory and her companions are determined to level up, gain better gear, and learn new abilities. They soon discover it might be more difficult than they realize when they encounter members of the Dark Forces. Will their actions have the wrong consequences, or will they have time to gain the experience points they need before becoming the target of the Dark Forces? The story is written by Australian authors using Australian spelling. I guess that's a thing, uh, it, an issue for some people. Um, this is a really easy review. Um, this Almost the entirety of this novel is slice of life adventuring. Um, there's not really much else to it. Um, and in some respects, that's good. In some respects, it's, I'm like, it's a little disappointing. Um, the comedy descriptions in the novel, they're okay. They mostly come down to descriptions of like actually as if like people were role playing and rolling the dice and describing what they were doing, but without the game master describing what those effects are. So a lot of times they come and do, oh, a character throws a fireball and a fireball, and then the character shoots an arrow and it hits the person or the the the, the undead or whatever. And then another person, you know, slices. And that's kind of the extent of the combat description. So not not the best part of the story. Um and cutting it, the story overall feels very slice of life and it's okay if that's what you want to do it's very easy to pick up and put down but again the the story on its own just like it was never super engaging for me because um for me i was expecting something um i guess a little more related to the end of book one at the end of book one the there's this whole thing about the guardians of the round type which is like the title of the series uh where the main character is essentially joining this secret society um that is that um and again this is slightly spoiler if you haven't read book one but like part of the big theme of the novel in book one was, oh, the things that happen in the game affect the real world. And it's a big, like the last like third of the novels as they take place in the real world where the main characters are being told and they're being shown, oh, these are the impacts and evil, uh, the evil exists in the game can come to the real world just like the main characters can and, and they can affect things there and, and go back and forth and they have the same powers as the main characters and, and there's this whole big, ep like kind of implied epic storyline like, oh, there's like this really big thing happening um, and, and these are the heroes that are going to help save the world um, as, as part of this large organization and none of that really shows up in book two. Like almost none of like there there are a few references to it, but most of the book too is just like oh the main characters are adventuring, 
they're going on some semi-interesting quests sometimes. Um, they're fighting, they're leveling up, they're getting new gear, they're getting pets and all that good stuff. Um, and that's kind of it. That, I mean, there's generally just them doing some basic strutter quest. And I thought, personally, I thought that was kind of over in book one, where they're still doing strutter quest. And it's still kind of existing in book two. I was like, oh, that's 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 a choice um it just wasn't as entertaining as i thought it was going to be so for me it gets a score of six out of ten um guardians of the round table goblins boots again not a boring story necessarily just i'm um, like oh i was expecting more i guess uh maybe that's just on me but for me it just wasn't as good as i thought it was going to be uh so for me it gets a score of six out of ten guardians of the round table book number two goblin boots so there we go Okay, on to Anomaly, uh, Somnia Online book number two, written by KT Hanna. It is 354 pages, $4.99, not available on Kindle Limited. Um, here's the author's description. As Murmur reels in the wake of the secrets her friends tried to keep, her grip on what is real and what is virtual begins to slip. What's more, she's no longer sure who she can trust. Stalked across the continent by a rogue with a vendetta, Murmur is forced to dig deep and develop her abilities before she finds a knife in her back. Suspicion surrounds the AIs as well. Their behaviors too human, their reports too perfect. Shayla and Laura must uncover the truth before the system raises concerns and Murmur is lost forever. So there you go. That's the author's description of the story. Um, there are a lot of things in I really enjoyed about book one. Um, in the series, book two unfortunately has lost me a little bit. Um, it's not again not a bad story in any way, shape, or form. There's some really good elements of here. Um, there's just there's also a few noticeable, more noticeable flaws. Like in book two, for some reason, there just, just seemed like there's more technical writing errors than there were in book. And I'm not the only person who knows. So there's another few reviews and for the description. I was like, oh, they noticed as well. So it, it is a thing. But it wasn't as much to, uh, there wasn't something that's, that's super distracting, just like, oh, there should be an S there, or this word is spelled incorrectly, or, you know, little tiny things like that. But again, uh, surprisingly more than there was in book one. Um, what for me, what became a bigger issue for is that me is that the story kind of shifted a little bit um, from what it was in book one, and it was just, it just wasn't as interesting to me as book one was. Uh, book two makes essentially the game portion of the story and the rpg progression progression feel almost like a secondary or tertiary concern in the plot line um and for me the thing i really love about letter bd is the game stuff it really is it's, it's making the game matter making it important to the story like the the story kind of revolving around the game mechanics and in this particular instance it, it just didn't feel like that was the case necessarily it felt like other things um took priority in the story and whether that's good or bad it's up to each individual and i'll talk about what those other things are but for me it's like oh those the the game starts just kind of shifting to secondary or tertiary place like oh that's it is what it is but like i said i was like oh that just made it less interesting for me personally um and you can kind of tell by a couple ways that the game stuff really just mattered less or just took less priority for the author in in developing it um one there's less leveling on the part of the main character in book one um the main character and all her friends level like crazy. They get up to like think level seventeen in book one, um, and in book two, they you know the main character levels up eight times. And again, that's that's you know half as much. And part of that can be explained by like, oh, as you level, it should be more difficult. But the other portion of that is like the author just spends less time with the game stuff. It, she really does. Like the it just spends less time with the main character adventuring and leveling. There are just other things that happen that take again story precedence. Now, another thing you can tell, like, oh, the game stuff takes less precedence is that there's just, like, a lot of different shifts from the main character. Like, the main character's point of view is still the majority of the story. But there's, like, an additional, I want to say, like, six or seven other points of views that show up in the story. Um, and you get, like, their little snippets. And I was like, oh, you, that's, again, just kind of a shift from what occurred in book number one a little bit. And that, again, it just kind of shows oh, the storyline is, is shifting away from the game stuff a little bit more. And again, maybe this is going to be uh, the first stepping stone in like a super epic storyline. Um, and, and book three might be super amazing. Book four might be even better. I don't know. Um, I certainly hope it is. But for me, it's just like, again, the game stuff just wasn't as impactful to the story. And again, that, that was just less interesting to me. Instead, um, there are just other things that occur. Um, let's see. Um, again, uh, the other things that kind of occur are just in the emotional exploration. Let's see. 
Um, yeah, the main POVs develop the new non-game storyline focused and set on emotional exploration, intrigue, and cyber thriller elements. So and essentially those are the things that take precedence over game stuff for me, uh, at least from my point of view in the story. Uh, like a lot more time was spent on them, especially in the beginning and end of the novel like those things took like a, almost a majority of the story um time um the emotional exploration comes in the form of like lots of talking and thinking from a lot of characters there's like a generally a good portion of the story where this is done where it's not just the main character exploring how she feels about um again i don't want to get to like the revelation at the end of book one um, and how it affects her and how she's thinking of the, her friends now who kept the secret from her. But also you get that same kind of emotional exploration from her mom, from her mom's friend, from like some work people, from the AIs, from her friends in the game. Um, and, and from the AIs individually, from the AIs together, from just like kind of random game companies, even from enemies um, in the story. Like you get like some points of views from them. Um, and again, it's, it's not necessarily bad. It's just like, oh, that was just slightly less interesting like the emotional exploration for some people it's gonna be super engaging like they're gonna see it as a great amount of character development and for me it was like i didn't need as much uh and for me it just wasn't like, it's not my thing like that much emotional exploration like i said there are other reviews for this novel but they're like this is amazing emo i love the emotion and the depth of that discussion um for me it just kind of went on a little too long uh but again just maybe again i'm hoping that it this all is like the stepping stone for like a super awesome story, but when this one just didn't work for me, um, the cyber thrill elements include questions about emerging AI, entry questions about what the game developer is using for tech, what is really happening with the main character and the shady goals of the AI, which is all kind of inferred in the in the novel description, so it's not spoilery. Um, and again, there's still MMO action inventory. There is. I'm not saying that there's not here. Uh, the main character's group does some leveling, some class progression. I thought some of that class progression was a little odd for me, uh, but it was not uninteresting, uh, which is different. Um, and it's just that there's not as much of that as there was in book one. And that's that's just what it is. Um, and again, the games are just, for me, felt relegated to a less important place in the story and definitely less impactful to the story arc. Like the game stuff, like, oh, all these cyber thriller elements, like they felt really important. Like, oh, there's an intrigue and there's some stuff here. And like, some of it's exciting. Some of it just wasn't, I mean, that interesting to me, but I can see like there's a building story arc there. Um, but the game stuff, is just like, oh, it's just like some stuff she does to level and to, to continue to increase her power and, and, and to do some archive progression. But it doesn't really feel important as important to the story as it did in book one. Um, overall, I just didn't have as good a time with book two as I did book one. That's what it comes down to for me. Again, it's not boring. My name's Stripped to the Imagination. And a lot of the folks have seemed to really enjoy this. Um, it's just, I'm just not into <laughs> that emotion and intrigue and cyber thriller stuff as I am into just like good gaming stories with lots of action. And that's just, it's a personal preference. Um, and like I said, I, I certainly hope that book three just blows me out of the water. But for, for now, this one just got to score six out of 10. Uh, and folks who are more into those elements that I talked about, um, they'll probably like book two more than I, than I did. And maybe like it more than book one. Uh, but for me, it just, it just didn't, it didn't do it for me, unfortunately. Uh, so again, not a bad score. It's just like, Oh, it just didn't hide quite it good for me. So it scores six out of 10. That's anomaly. Uh, Somnia online book number two. Okay. On to, there you go. Um, Underworld, Through the Belly of the Beast, Underworld, book number two, uh, by Apollo Thorne. It is 352 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Surviving Lord Darius's attack has put Elrond's level over the top. He must soon leave the mistress's labyrinth for the unknown dangers of the Underworld. There are three paths that stand before him. Should he absorb all the blue magic he can find? Power level his fellow captives or take on the Bone Palace alone. The Underworld is waiting. And honestly, that description really only describes like the very first beginning, like where the beginning of the novel starts. A lot of other stuff happens. Um, this is a good sequel to Level Up or Die, which is the first book in the series. And this time, Eloran, uh, Elorion um, and the gang are on the run from a dangerous enemy that's sending minion after minion after them. It's action scene after action scene with good lulls in between for RPG leveling, magical theorizing, and a bit of character development. Um, but let's be honest, the best thing about the series is the action and the power level. And I think that's one of the things about the series that just, it, it knows its strength and it kind of plays in that. Um, and, and for folks who like the kind of story, this is this is definitely top notch in, in that particular subgenre of like power leveling, RPG, little RPG kind of stuff. 
Um, and, and definitely richer than Spade in the novel. Um, there's even a little bit of dungeon creation in this story, even the to add a little bit of variety, but again, it's, it's a very minor portion of the story. Overall, it's just the main character fighting, leveling, getting new powers, learning new things, uh, developing strategies, and you know, getting problem. And again, that does, it, it's, it doesn't seem like a complicated concept, but the author does it well. Uh, and, and like I said, it's a good action oriented liturgy and it flew by whenever I like it. I got this thing in one day and I finished it before the end of the day. And it's, it's over like, it's over 300 pages. Um, so that kind of tells you how action and how well paced it is. Uh, so for me, it gets a score of 7.7 7 out of 10, a uh, very good story. I had a good time with it. So there you go. That's score 7.7 7 out of 10 for Underworld through the Belly of the Beast Underworld book number two. So there we go. And that's it, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the show. Thank you very much for listening, for, for hanging out with me. Remember, if you want to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, or website, um, we have all the links in the show notes for those for those links. Um, you can also follow a bunch of other great lit RPG Facebook pages for authors and, and readers gather and talk and chat and, and communicate good stuff there uh, if you want to enjoy the podcast and you want to support us in any way shape or form come out all the ways to do so at littlerpgpodcast.com uh, com slash support so there you go folks thanks for hanging out with me this week um, and remember this is the quick heads up next week as episode of the show um, I'm going to be recording in advance um, so I'm probably going to get to all the stories that come out that entire week just because I'm recording it very early in the week uh, because I'm going to be at Dragon Con uh, on Thursday by the time that this, that show actually airs. So I'm setting up in advance. Um, so just don't get too mad at me if I don't read your, your novel when it comes out after I record. Um, um, but until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen, remember to go read some lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody.